everybody, and welcome to the Remembering Akron podcast. I'm your host, Derek Maxfield, and today my guest is Gene Wilson. Welcome, Gene. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. So your story starts in 1926. So that is between the wars. Yes. And the Great Depression hasn't started just quite yet, but it would soon. Yes, I'm very aware of that. So you you lived through some difficult times. It was a big part of my childhood. You did not throw anything away that was usable. You ate every scrap of food. That, at least that's what my grandmother would have us do. But we were always told about, remember the starving children in Armenia. In Armenia? I don't know why, but okay. it was Armenia. All right. But so, that didn't make me like vegetables any better. No. All right. <laughs> were you born at home? No, I was born in Buffalo in Millard, the old Millard Fillmore Gates Circle Hospital. All right. Which and, is no more. Which is no more. And uh, tell me about your parents. I don't know much about my parents because my father died when I was three and a half years old. I know that he was a civil engineer and he worked in the mines, in the gypsum mines, uh, surveying. His name was, was Charles Winchester. Yes, and he was one of the earliest scoutmasters in Akron. He, My brother remembered going on camping trips with him oh. when they went to Hawaii. And um, he and my mother both were active in the Episcopal Church. There was no Episcopal Church here, but we were a mission of the church in Oakfield. And I believe my mother sang in that choir over there, but I, I'm really not positive of that because I was too little to know. Because my father died, as I said, in July, and my mother died in the following October uh, of complications after a, a C-section baby. And that baby did not grow up with us because I was we were left with a grandmother who was then 64 years old. And when I got to be 64 and thought about raising three children, my hair stood on end. So the baby was adopted by a family in Clarence. However, they kept in touch with us, so we knew her. She knew that we were her, her siblings. And then later on, uh, we became close friends, and I'm in touch with all of her children because she has since passed on, too. Oh. And um, so that's about it. Then we were raised by a grandmother who was who took on this terrific job, as I say, of three kids, one 10-year-old, an 8-year-old boy, and myself, who was four. And she was a strict disciplinarian, but she did what she had to do. She had very little money to work with. She had heart trouble, and she had arthritis, so she did not get around very well. But she loved us, and she did one heck of a job. Now, this grandmother, was this your father's or your mother's mother? This was my mother's mother. I see. She, from what my sister told me, she was already living with us at the time, so she kind of knew our routine. So that made it a little easier than right. if she had come from far away, and you know, we didn't know her at all. But mm -hmm. So we knew her. And... Um, uh, she made sure that we did our homework, and she made darn sure that I practiced the piano because she was determined that I was going to learn to play the piano. What was her name? Her name was Addie Shaw. Shaw. She had grown up in Portland, Maine, and she herself had a lot of tragedy in her life. Her She had lost her second husband in 1922, her younger daughter in 1928, and her older daughter, who was my mother, in 1930. So, and she had gone to, they had gone to Colorado, I think in about the 18, around 1890, because her first husband had TB. Oh and my. at that time, the only cure for TB was fresh mountain air, right. which really was not a cure because he died out there. Mm -hmm. And she had one uh, child, my, my uncle, was born out there. And then she had another baby, a 14-pound baby in the 1890s or late oh 80s, my. which must have been, which was stillborn. And uh, then she came back to uh, New England, and my mother was born there in Portland. And then in a, less than a year, she married another man. And this is, was to me, was highly unusual at that time. But there had been an agreement between... Uh, Fred Shaw, the second husband, and the first husband, Charles Walker, that he would take care of her if something happened to the first husband because I think he knew he was going to die probably. Oh. So um, then she had two more children, and um, that's it. Wow. Yeah. Do you know uh, the family ancestry on either side? I have a printed um, 
genealogy on the Winchester side. I don't know much about the other side. I remember names, but I don't really know the relationship. There was a great uncle who was a jeweler, and uh, somewhere in that genealogy, there was a, a shipbuilder, I believe, in Nova Scotia, oh. and he, I think he's the one who lived to be a hundred. Wow. And I had one uncle, my mother's brother, lived to be a hundred and one, I think. Wow. So. I have good genes and I have bad genes. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. So um, ethnically, um, are they uh, are your uh, ancestors from Western Europe? Yes, my we had a a, a, a book, and I'm, I think one of my grandchildren has it. I hope of the Weeks family. That was my my mother's side of the family, and they came over in the late 1600s from England. And I think there's some French in there, but I, as I say, I'm not sure about that because I was too young to inquire into family history yeah. when there was somebody alive to talk about it. Well, people tend to get more interested in history and their family history as they get older. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And sometimes by that time, it's too late to ask the kind of questions we would like to be asking. Exactly. So you grew up in the Akron area. I did. And did you graduate from school here? I did. Uh, I did was... you start out at a one-room schoolhouse? I did not. The the present school building, the 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 westernmost edge of end of it, was built. I think the cornerstone reads nineteen twenty five, the year before I was born. So I went from kindergarten through high school in that building. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right. And you graduated a, uh, from your se senior in year nineteen forty four. I was valedictorian. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. That's really nice. But How I, big was your class? There were only by the time we graduated, there were only forty two of us. This was wartime. Yeah. When we were freshmen, ninth graders, there were ninety I think about ninety students and we lost about half of them because a lot of people quit school and went to work. They could make what was big money, maybe fifty cents an hour. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't really remember. And a lot of the boys quit early and joined the service and um so we were, and when I graduated, there were, there were thirty nine of us on stage, I believe, and nine boys and the rest were girls. So that was how thin we were by that time. Yeah, the war really took its toll. It did. And it how really many did. of those boys came home? I I remember one boy who was killed before we graduated. He wasn't really in my class, though. I think he was a year or so ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Um. I think all those boys came home who went and, and, you know, I don't remember any, because remember, the combat ended the next year, 1945, so they were really not probably trained enough to go overseas yet, although there was one young man who didn't graduate, he was in my class, but he was older, and he joined the Navy, and he was in quite a lot of the battles over, and he was on an LST, he was over in the Pacific. Pacific. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you remember Franklin Roosevelt? I certainly do. My do grandmother think? was a dyed in the wool Republican. The year that Alf Landon ran against him, which I believe was 1932, we had a huge poster in our front door of Alf Landon, and she was a great admirer of Herbert Hoover. She thought Al, uh, Roosevelt, she called him that Santa Claus in the White House <laughs> because he started all the programs, you know, okay. the giveaways, yeah. and uh, she was very annoyed about that. Mm -hmm. She was a woman who, she didn't, I, th I think she finished high school, but I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but she was a very bright woman, and she was always well-informed. She read the paper, she listened to news on the radio. Lowell Thomas was her favorite commentator, who had a nightly program of 15 minutes of news, mm -hmm. and uh, she could have sat down, I believe, and talked with anybody. A college wow. dean or the president of the United States intelligently. She had a wow. wonderful vocabulary. And um, she was, we had, we had what were children's encyclopedias at the time. It was called a Book of Knowledge. Mm -hmm. And there was a companion set to that. that. That was 20 volumes. And there was a companion set of children's books called My Book House. And they were progressively more difficult. The first one was nursery rhymes, and the second one was fairy tales, and then it was maybe adventure stories and so on up through, you know, that were good reading. And we always had books in our house, so we were always encouraged to read. And she used to read stories to us, I remember, at bedtime. She could do any accent. She could do Southern. She could do Jewish. She could do—she was a wonderful reader. So. <laughs> 
Well, that's very entertaining then, isn't <laughs> it? It was. It was. She taught me how to waltz on the kitchen floor. Did she really? When I was about eight years old. Mm-hmm. My goodness. <laughs> well, that's a good skill to have. Yeah. So what did you do once you graduated high school? I went off to nursing school. At that time, you got your nurse's training in a hospital. I went to New York City, St. Luke's Hospital. Because this was wartime, and they were recruiting new nurses, you know, for all these things because graduate nurses were joining the service, so they really needed nurses. And I was very, I thought I was going to contribute to society. Well, it didn't turn out that I was meant to be a nurse because it, was, it, it wasn't my field, really. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I learned a lot that year, you know, a lot of things that I'm glad I learned. I never forgot about anatomy and physiology and so on and so on. And I had... I had fun because I, you know, went to New York City, and that was a great experience for this little small town girl. Yeah, right. Well, baptism by fire in many ways to it go was. from such a small place. It was. It was. It really was. And then I went to RIT because I really didn't know what I wanted to do or be, and uh, I really never wanted to be a teacher. I taught piano while I was married. Uh, I, le- I learned that skill well enough that I could teach, and I taught a lot of kids in Akron how to play the piano for about 20 years. And I also was taught uh, pipe organ, my my teacher, and I need to tell you that story, too. Yeah. After my grandmother died, and this is kind of disjointed, I don't know. No, I hope okay. this is going to be... hear this. Okay. My grandmother lived another 10 years, so she died when I was 14, okay. right after my 14th birthday. And then I went to live with the Eckerson family, you, Nancy's grandparents. Oh, okay. And... Um, Mrs. Eckerson was my piano teacher. She and her husband and my parents had gotten acquainted when my parents moved to Akron, I believe, in 1924. They lived on the same street. Okay. Both the husbands were engineers. Both the women were musicians, so they got acquainted. They had, a, they had children about the same age, and so they walked their babies and so on and so on and got to be good friends. So when it came time... Uh, for me to start to play the piano, I was about, I think I was about seven, and my grandmother could see that I had talent. So somehow, I don't know how it was arranged, but I got my piano lessons from Mrs. Eckerson and at no charge because we had no money for piano lessons. We were living on a pension from my father's service in the World War. He served in France and uh, was, a, I believe, a first lieutenant, and uh, he survived a gas attack during that war, but came home, you know, he had heart trouble, but um, I don't suppose he knew it at the time. He also was a heavy smoker, according to what I've heard, so that didn't help him any. And um, so I lived with the Eckersons then until I graduated from high school. I was there for, I lived there until I got married. And um, so she taught Mrs. Eckerson, she was, she became mom to me by then because I was treated as a member of their family. And I have to say, there were a lot of people in town after my parents died who were very, very kind to us. They always made sure we had Christmas presents. So Akron is a very, a very caring place to live and to raise children, I think. You're all right. You were telling me about learning how to play the pipe organ. Yes. And that turned out to be my favorite thing to do in the music. That and accompanying were my two favorite musical things to do. And I played, I wish I had kept a log of all the weddings I played for because I ended up playing for weddings in almost every church in Akron. I played for a wedding in Batavia one time and I played in Medina and I played in Heaven knows where. And if I had kept track, I ended up playing for weddings of the children whose parents' weddings I played at. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so it, wonderful. Yeah, so it kept on through the yeah. through the years. That is really nice. So you mentioned very briefly that you got married along the way. Mm-hmm. I married Calvin Stabell, whose father ran a butcher shop in town. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. And was very well known, and he was one of, he was the youngest of six children, and his parents died when he was in his teens. He lost his father, his mother, and his oldest brother now within the space of... common there. Yeah. So we were, we really wanted a family that was ours. 
So we got married way too young and struggled as a result. Yeah. But uh, we had a good life. And then um, had all these kids and uh, five girls and a boy. And they, I, I have to say, they all have become successful adults. And some of them, most of them went to college. And they're all independent. They have made their way in the world. And I'm very, very proud and very thankful for that. In fact, one of my daughters went to GCC. Oh, really? Yeah. She went on from there to Syracuse and nice. studied uh, landscape architecture and did not graduate because that, that turned out to be a five-year program and she'd had enough. But she she's a wonderful gardener now. She raises all kinds of vegetables. They just they eat very well because it's garden to table. Very nice. And you've got 10 grandchildren now? I have 11 grandchildren and 8 grandchildren. Great grandchildren. My goodness. Yeah. That must keep you busy, huh? Well, they're not, I don't see a lot of them very often because I have one daughter who lives in Oregon. Oh. One daughter who lives in Vermont and one daughter who lives in Florida. So there are two great grandchildren that I've never seen. The ones who live in, he lives in Seattle. Oh. And, um, I have some I have some more greats in Florida that I haven't seen yet, but I'm going to see them because there's a wedding coming up in October, and I'm going down there for that. Oh, very nice. Yeah. So, so I have saved the most difficult questions for last. Are you ready? I'm not sure. You're scaring me. <laughs> so imagine years from now, and your grandchildren, or maybe great-grandchildren, are telling their children about you. What would you hope they said? I would hope they said that she was a bright woman. She cared about other people. She took life by the horns and made the best of it. And <laughs> she was hard to get along with at times, but she had a great sense of humor. <laughs> If you could leave some advice to your descendants, what would that be? That advice would be not to be quite so judgmental of other people, to try to find the good in everybody first and then make your judgment. And uh, you can't always tell a book by its cover. I know I've been too quick to uh, judge other people by a first meeting, and that's really not fair. And I would also... <laughs> I would also wish that they could be a little more um, slow to anger and gentle. I'm very quick. I have a very quick temper, and this has always been a struggle for me. But um, I've always set high standards for myself and for my family, too. So that's kind of a can be a conflict, you know. Yeah. Well, I think that's wonderful advice. And on that note... I want to thank you for joining us, Gene. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Thanks for listening in, and remember to tune in to the next episode of Remembering Akron.